Dobar dan ljudi, dobar dan svima. Lijepo što ste se spojili u petak u 12 sati pred produženi vikend i odlučili poslušati odličnu ekipu iz Adakte Beterne koji će vam otkriti neke zanimljive stvari oko ML-a i vezano za Azure platformu. Ja više neću sad puno pričati, daću dečkima, oni su poredani onako fino jedan od druga, ali ima svako svoj laptop pa će biti i interakcije. Pitajte, evo Mar- Martin je sam rekao, ono, hoće li ljudi pitati, željni su da ih pitate i da razgovarate s njima i da se povežete, dečki su u Sloveniji sad, tako da možete pitati neke druge stvari ako zaime. Martin, izvoli. Uh, Kada ćemo ugleći na... Ja, yeah. ok. Uh, ok, uh, we will talk in English, since we are not very good in uh, Croatian, uh, except one... Uh, who is know, actually from Croatia? Is, yes, from Rijeka. <laughs> So uh, we are the data science team from Beterna uh, and today we will talk and have a workshop about uh, Azure ML platform. Uh, so Boja had a lecture on Wednesday and uh, she told about in uh, deep uh, uh, about uh, how this project went and uh, what it is for. And today we will get a little bit technical uh and show some uh show some ways how to interact with uh as we are all data scientists and how to interact with the customer uh so that uh, he or she can uh, see the results very quickly so firstly we will go a little bit through introduction uh then we will uh see uh Actually, we are going to use uh, some technology called Azure Functions, which is uh, which works works on the cloud. Uh, then we will uh, take a look about uh, on a different aspect how to do a data science on cloud, uh, where we will show some Jupyter, uh, actually Python code on Jupyter on Azure, and. Uh, Last but not least, uh, we will show visualization. So after we uh, create uh, our models, we get a lot, a ton of results, and uh, our end user, so customer, has to understand these results. So uh, here comes in hand uh, powerful BI tools like Power BI, uh, ClickSense. But today we will uh, show you Power BI. Uh, so to tell you a little bit about our team, uh, actually we are part of the BI team uh, in Adacta and uh, a part of this team uh, we, uh, we uh, constructed data science, uh, uh, data science team uh, from which Bojidara is uh, lead and also have, as I said, presentation on Wednesday. Uh, then, uh, then we are here, uh, three, let's say, workers. <laughs> now we all work. So uh, uh, she is our lead, and I'm Martin. And on my left is Nat, Hi. and on my right <coughs> is Nina. And to, uh, together we uh, we try to do uh, as good as we can for our customers. So. Uh, what is our problem? So the customer comes to us and say and, and says, uh, I want to have data science. I want to have machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, all these buzzwords. And this is all he heard, but uh, doesn't really know how to, uh, how to implement this in their system. So actually what our task is to create some proof of concept uh solutions uh, so that customer can uh, see what uh, what he actually wants to do uh and what is our problem uh is that uh, we need a lot of uh, computing power uh, a lot of ram or a lot of cpus so that can be for the start very expensive if we, if we come to him and say hey uh, i want you to buy me a big powerful machine with the gpu and so on and uh, so uh, we need we needed to find some way how to quickly create some uh, good solutions and test it without him having to spend fortune on uh, hardware so uh, uh, this is why we choose uh, 
this uh, platform to be built on Azure. So Azure, as we know, is a cloud solution and it has a ton of uh, technologies uh, installed on it. Uh, and in my opinion, it's getting somewhere where even data, sci uh, data scientists can use it on a fairly simple way, but still have the uh, freedom to, uh, to code whatever they want. And we, we will see that in, uh, in a minute. So uh, then when we have this uh, proof of concept built, uh, our next problem is to, um, to evaluate. So uh, what will uh, what will our system uh, uh, what will our system uh, bring to the to the firm to the customer will it be good uh, so what if we can uh, forecast uh, exactly the sale uh, they want, uh, it, that it will happen in the future so we have to show our customers uh, what will be their return of investment but this is really a tricky task because a lot of things can uh, can uh, uh, can uh, 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 can go wrong, and a lot of things can affect this uh, investment. Uh, for for instance, even now where we have Corona, this this was uh, totally unpredictable, and um, uh, as the future, you really don't know. Uh, how to uh, how to take all these uh, how, all, all these circumstances in account, but uh, but still we have to somewhat calculate it. So we do a, a, a simulations. Uh, what could go what could go wrong? What what are probabilities of the certain events? And this is what we uh, at the end try to calculate and present to the customer. So uh, when you start building your proof of concept. Uh, you have to get good results and also you have to uh, uh, get good presentations with quick results. So uh, for this case, we use some BI tools like uh, Power BI and uh, ClickSense. Uh, so the, uh, the, the reason is why we use it because we really um, create a lot of, let's say, uh, by forecasting a lot of predictions, a lot of optimization, so a lot of data. We generate a lot of data and the customer must be able to see to that data with certain graphs, uh, line charts, tables nevertheless, and so on. So, uh, what is our, uh, actually what is our uh, purpose is to, um, to say to the customer, okay, we will do firstly data discovery to search for your bottlenecks to search where you can uh, where you can uh, improve uh, what what are you doing wrong in your work process so with that we uh, we use all kind of uh, data science techniques uh, to see uh, on the single uh, event uh, where we can help customer uh, create quick and good uh, proof of concepts and then uh, with the customer, we decide what is the best way to go next. So today we will show you one of these uh, uh, ways how to quickly use the technology of uh, Azure Cloud Technologies and, uh, and uh, build your custom, uh, your custom solution uh, to help the customer to see its value on the cloud solutions without him or, uh, having to invest into uh, storage, CPU, GPU, RAM, and so on. So, Azure Functions. Actually, Microsoft built this uh, and call it, now it's everything called with SAS, FAS, PAS, and this is one of the new uh, terms. So, function as a service. Uh, actually, this is a serverless uh, technology, which means uh, that when you uh, send a uh, request, uh, it uh, the code floats somewhere and it gets uh, executed uh, on the random server from which you don't know in advance where when where this will it will happen. Uh, it has 
a very good integrated integrated programming model. For instance, uh, when we tried to um, when we tried to connect uh, some uh, machine learning models and our whole solution with uh, BI tools to be uh, to be applicable to the user, so the user could uh, interact with our solution, uh, change the parameters, see the solution, or um, do, do some actions. Actually, uh, we uh, we must we we had to code it uh, ourselves. So using technology, web technologies like Django, uh, put it on the iOS server on Windows, and uh, for starters, it was it was a lot of pain. We we did have to do it, and with this, with Microsoft Azure Functions, it all, it all comes in hand. So. Uh, actually, Azure Functions uh, takes care of uh, getting the server, being online, uh, getting certificates, uh, uh, and then bindings with requests, with uh, all blob triggers, which we'll see. That means that when you upload that, it triggers your program. So uh, it is really nicely done by... Uh, uh, by Microsoft, and we're really easily, uh, very re really easily uh, usable, as we see, as we will see it in um, in a minute. What else? It has it has also really good uh, debugging uh, debugging tool uh, on development and uh, on deployment on the cloud. So when something goes wrong, and believe me. Uh, a lot of things will go wrong, as you, uh, as you, I suppose, know. If you are a programmer, uh, you can easily debug it. Uh, actually, it surprised me how uh, how good this was. Uh, not not only locally, but also on uh, you. You actually you have a power of your uh, program also deployed on the on the cloud. Uh, it has uh, a lot, uh, a lot of pricing plans. Right now, uh, this Linux consumption plan is the cheapest um, possible uh, option, and uh, I think it's pretty cheap. Uh, as uh, as uh, Microsoft partners and as uh, some license, you get uh, 120 euros per month. Microsoft as uh, as partners gives you for let's say free, and uh, while we develop this and some other stuff, we never uh, went uh, uh, we never went below zero with this uh, budget budget. Uh, so for uh, development, this is a good pricing plan. Uh, what is um, what is also interesting in Azure Functions is that. Uh, it comes with, I, I would say, almost all uh, popular languages uh, like uh, Python. You, you can actually develop in Python and in all classical Microsoft languages like C Sharp, uh, also Java. So actually, it supports a lot of uh, programming languages to just develop. Uh, core development to create your service, and this is really nice. Since we, we, as we said, we came from uh, data science world, uh, uh, and uh, I think that we are most comfortable in Python. So uh, we could develop everything in Python from start to to the end without C sharp code. I think this is quite a, a good feature. And it's also uh, recommended by Microsoft that uh, you should use the same deployment and model development language uh, just to to have all uh, under the same hood. But still, still you can uh, you can develop in one languages. Let's say you develop models in uh, Python and then uh, develop services on Azure Functions C Sharp because still. C Sharp has some uh, 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 every every feature they uh, they develop uh, 
uh, I will tell you uh, later about which feature is firstly developed for C sharp language, then maybe across the year or half year it comes in Python. So if you always want to be uh, on the uh, updated side, then C sharp is the way to go. But Python is really good supported also for uh, uh, for for this task. I think Microsoft decided this uh, because of the because of the data science world and demand. So we all know Python. We don't know C sharp. I think okay a little bit. <laughs> okay. So what is also good about Azure Functions is the freedom of uh, having everything uh, everything pu uh, put to Microsoft. So, so you take care of everything. I will just uh, create my function and please uh, do the bindings, do the, do the virtualization, everything. And uh, you can have this running pretty fastly. But uh, what I didn't like, I don't know, two, three years ago uh, about cloud, is this that uh, for machine learning you had only several options, uh, let's say uh, uh, AutoML and then some day random forest, uh, etc. And then uh, that's it. You couldn't uh, tweak the code. Uh, you could, uh, but uh, they had this uh, drag and drop uh, machine learning studio. And actually, you uh, under the hood they also used uh, free source uh, Scikit-Learn and so on. But you you weren't uh, having this freedom. With this, you have all the freedom you need uh, because you can you can use your uh, open source libraries like TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, uh, and Pandas, of course, and uh, do it all your way. And then when you want it to post. Uh, so that other uh, users can use your function, you just simply create this serverless function, and it all uh, and it all runs. And exactly this uh, uh, we will show on, on the, uh, today's workshop. Uh, then you ha also can have containers. So actually, you can you can make your own container put uh, the Azure function uh, up and then uh, just uh, deploy it to the, to the, to the cloud. Uh, then you have all the other options and uh, on, on the end, if you don't want to pay it for the cloud, you can take all the Azure stack and put it on-prem. So uh, you can have everything taken care of with Azure cloud, but still, if you want, you can, uh, you can take your uh, technology and put it on your prem and uh, have all the uh, all the responsibility by yourself but still uh, today we will uh, t talk about the yeah, about these options so uh, actually we will make a linux consumption plan which is uh, the cheapest and the most uh, easy one and this will uh, Microsoft uh, create under the hood, and we will only look at this uh, point. Okay, uh, so that was all from my side, and now I will uh, I will give my dear uh, derogation stick to the. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Matt, uh, and I will be talking a bit about the uh, uh, Azure machine learning which is basic, basically a, 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 a huge suite of tools which facilitates uh, really a wide range of tasks from data preparation, um, model prototyping, all the way to deployment, basically. Um, a, um, yeah. um, um, we will talk about, uh, just, just to briefly go over the, all, the, all the different um, uh, things that are available. Uh, we have the drag and drop tool that uh, Martin already mentioned, which is not something we very commonly use, but it can be nice for somebody who doesn't have, you know, the experience with coding. Um, they offer a very convenient way uh, to set up uh, notebooks uh, and do everything you would uh, otherwise do in them locally, uh, which for those of you who use Python, I'm pretty sure also use uh, Jupyter notebooks, you know, for all, all, all kinds of uh, prototyping. Um, uh, providing tasks regarding, you know, 
data science and machine learning in particular. Um, um, they offer R scripts for those who are more comfortable with R. Um, they also um, let you um, code in VS code. Um, they also have the CLI, which is basically their way of uh, automating, allowing you to automate the whole process of machine learning. So um, all the things that I will talk about in the demo, such as setting up the workspace, the experiments, um, connecting it to the specific compute, um, all this can be automated so that you don't have to think about it um, once you have it set up. Um, and there are also many pre-installed open source libraries. So you, when, once you, when you start the, um, the notebook, for instance, um, you already have a few pre-installed environments uh, which contain all of the big libraries that you would want to use like in the beginning of the process. You know, if you want something specific like, I don't know, high prop for optimizing parameters or for a specific, I don't know, let's say grading boosting XGBoost algorithm, you can also do that. You just have to install the library, which is also very simple, right? Um, so there's one thing, um, uh, and let's talk about a bit, you know, about just why you would want to do it. Um, I mentioned already the uh, the easy prototyping. Um, uh, with this comes that not only can I prototype very easily uh, if I have a model that runs for let's say five ten minutes, uh, and I would do it locally. It might take up uh, a significant part of the resources that I have available. That is not an issue here. You can have as many models being trained at once as you as you wish on as many different compute targets. They can connect to all kinds of different storages, and it's all very you know blocky. There are many building blocks that you just put together um, through code basically and just works beautifully. Um, um, you can review the progress fairly easily as well. There are some graphs that are automatically um, drawn out uh, if you set up the code you know, in a way that it's supposed to be set up if you want to see graphs later on in the, um, in the workspace. We'll take a look at this as well later on. Um, one of the things that is amazing is also the ease of deployment. Uh, once you have went through the, through the through all the hoops, you have made your um, data analysis in the beginning, you research your data, you know it well, you prepared some models, you developed some features, you have all of these things and deployment is really just a few clicks away. You have your model that you can deploy with maybe the help of Azure functions, you can use a web app, all of this is very integrated. There is a lot of boilerplate code that is just hidden from you. You really don't have to take care of. Mm. Now let's talk about the Automala. Um, so as a part of my dem demonstration, we could uh, just understand how the whole prototyping and deployment process works. We could use any kind of um, machine learning algorithm, but we will be taking a look at the Automala. Uh, I feel that it's a very, very fun tool to use uh, once you get the data, just to get a ballpark estimate, you know, of what, uh, of what you can, what you can do with, uh, with your, uh, with your, um, with your data. Uh, it supports classification, regression, and time series. Um, but I have to note here that time series uh, is by default uh, default to the regression, to the breaking down the problem into a regression problem. If you want uh, to use Facebook's profit, for instance, you have to use the enterprise edition of the workspace, which of course costs a bit more, uh, and we will not be showcasing in this in this uh, in this demo later on. Um, um, so that is that is something to be to keep in mind. Um, uh, Automata also allows you to implement some basic solutions without any extensive programming knowledge. Um, or more specifically, machine learning knowledge, because it really does a lot under the hood. Uh, and all the things that it does, I will mention during the uh, demo part of the presentation, from filling in the blanks if there is not a, a very clean um, consecutive line of uh, data points in a time series, to making its own features based on grain or just deriving them from the um, time points, et cetera, right? Um, um, it basically saves time, it saves resources, and uh, that is something that I'm pretty sure we can all, all get on board of. Um, so yeah, uh, I have mentioned all these things already, uh, and I think I can give my word back to Nino now, so that he tells you a bit about the Polar BI and yeah. how it connects to the <laughs> okay, stack I'm that now, we mentioned. I'm in the spin again, uh, so... There we go. Hi. <laughs> 
so when we get the results from our algorithm, we still need. I first I want to mention that I am going to speak in English as my colleagues to support them in English, yeah. even though I can't speak in Croatian. Uh, so we get our results from our models and algorithm. We still need to visualize them and just to see what what happened. And we need to do it as good as we can interactively and as as the best we can. So we use Power BI or ClickSense, as Martin mentioned before. Uh, so what is Power BI? Power BI is business analytics or business intelligence service offered by Microsoft. It is free, so you can download Power BI desktop free from Microsoft Store. Uh, but for collaborating, for sharing, for making apps, you still need pro license or premium license. So for some basic reporting, you can still use it for free and we'll do some basic reporting today. Uh, so what is used for is, of course, used for connecting to and visualizing data, as we said, and as we would expect. So what you can see is that uh, data from various sources gets connected to uh, data from various sources gets connected to Power BI, imported into Power BI, and then we do some cool visualizations, as we'll do it today. Uh, so what about data sources? Uh, there are many data sources, for example, simple file that file sources such as uh, Excel file uh, uh, text tables TSV files and so on also there are connections to databases for example X database uh, MySQL uh, PostgreSQL uh, SAP HANA database and so on uh, power platform for example uh, Power BI reports can get published to Power BI service so you can actually publish your data to Power BI service and connect Power BI service uh, for uh, accessing the data and loading it into Power BI desktop afterwards. Uh, for us today, most interesting part is connecting to Azure because uh, we will be talking about Azure today. So we will connect to Azure Blob Storage, as you can see it here, and we will try that and we'll show that in our demo today. And uh, we have online services. For example, we can connect to SharePoint, we can connect to Google Analytics, we can connect to uh, uh, Facebook Analytics, and so on. And there are some other sources for us, like machine learning engineers or data scientists. Really good thing is that we can connect to our scripts or Python scripts. And really good thing is that you can create your own code in Python script and just connect uh, query editor to and load the script uh, in Power BI. And it can do actually the whole ETL process for you. Uh, and then after we said something about data sources, we go to uh, query editor where we transform data. It's actually transform data is the button you click to access query editor. It's used for ETL, which stands for extraction, transforming and loading data. And uh, it's really good about it is that uh, in difference from some other, uh, some other uh, BI tools, it has user interface and programming interface. So you can access programming interface from advanced editor can use uh, uh, user interest really simply and drop columns, set columns, make some other, make new columns, and you see all the applied steps here, and you can see how the how the, your uh, imported tables change uh, with each step. Uh, then we have data model. Of course, uh, there is some relationship between uh, tables, and we connect tables uh, in relationship view of Power BI. And in the end, we have a second part of actual modeling. It's called DAX. Uh, it's data analysis expressions. It's like which we uh, write our, uh, calculate our columns. We calculate our tables in it and we calculate measures. And it looks something like this. For example, uh, this is a simple DAX formula for calculating sales, uh, forecasted sales uh, for the next 30 days. And, then, and it's actually really similar to, uh, uh, to Excel formulas until some point when it's not. <laughs> for, simple, for simple things, it is like summing, averaging, and on. But when you do calculations and grouping and, and so on, it can get a, more, a bit more complicated. And uh, the third part which we'll talk about is visualizations. There are two types of visualizations. You can have basic visualizations, such as slicer or filter, uh, card, KPI, graphs, like bar charts, line charts, combo charts, tables, pivot tables, uh, maps, uh, etc. And uh, you can have custom visualizations you can download from Microsoft Mar Marketplace. And what visuals provide for us, uh, we, they provide us uh, to interactively inspect the data, which we'll see today, and to interpret the results. Uh, for example, we'll see today how uh, our models and our algorithms predict sales, predict uh, for the future 
a stock and how we can uh, interpret our results from uh, the algorithm. And this is the app that we will look today. So we will try to create something similar like this, but not the completely because it's, it will take us too much time, but we'll still create some simple graphs and a table from the resulting data from blob storage that, will, that our, my colleagues will make. So uh, that's it. And you can see visualizations are accessed right here in this pane. And now I'll leave, leave my word to Martin again. Okay. So uh, actually we are coming to, the, to an end of our presentation and uh, the start of our workshop. So actually, uh, what is our um, picture of our of our pipeline today is that uh, on some point, uh, and what is also our our uh, way how to deal with uh, with customers to create some proof of concept uh, projects. So uh, firstly, you have to have input data. So um, actually, we will upload the data on the Azure Blob Storage. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, we are actually creating some uh, some picture where where the customer will be able to come to our site and say, "Hey, uh, please test my data on your algorithms." So uh, we will actually create a website where the right input form will be uh, contacted to our uh, client and he will be alone able to uh, uh, upload the data and then uh, the, the algorithm and the cloud will, uh, will calculate this data and then some output will come out. Uh, so uh, actually we, use, uh, we can use Azure functions and we can also use web apps for uploading the data. But uh and we uploaded it to uh, a, some storage so it can be uh databases it can be uh, blob storages uh, actually it can be also if you have some erp system uh in your firm it it can connect to a database but of course uh, it it must be um, it must, we must talk before so we know what your database is like. Uh, and actually, that's it. Then we have some black box. That is our algorithm uh, that we want to uh, that we want to give to our customer, so they are able to test it without uh, without. Firstly, uh, they they don't get our code. Secondly, they get results and ca can quickly uh, calculate their revenue, return of interest, and see how well a forecast uh, works. Uh, and uh, uh, we can we can quickly uh, say to them, okay, uh, the, uh, this data is uh, go goodly uh, presented, and maybe uh, on this data you have to do some work. So actually how our system uh, looks like. Uh, this is actually our uh, uh, system where we, uh, which Voja talks about, talked about. Uh, it's built out of uh, Forecaster, which forecasts uh, future sales. Uh, uh, of course, uh, at the beginning we have some monitors, so uh, this monitor can say, wow, these sales, uh, uh, jumped really highly, so we have to take care of this item, but uh, other 95% items are okay. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, these all with sales and these uh, daily stock calculations all go to scheduler, uh, where uh, where all the where scheduler uh, simply uses these forecasts and then. Uh, predicts what the stock will be like and takes into account all the other uh, things uh, some customer have to take be, be aware of such as uh, watching expiration date of some items or uh, or uh, any other specifics you can have on item but this is all custom then for from customer to customer uh, then these are uh, sales forecasting and stock optimization model produce results, a lot of results. 
and we have to output it somewhere. Uh, again, databases, uh, blob storages, uh, if you have on prem, we can save it on disks. Uh, so again, Azure functions uh, or Azure web apps or any other um, web technology um, take care of this. But as I said, Azure functions is the most simple way to put it on the cloud. So actually uh, we, can, uh, we can program it this here in Slovenia and then uh, really easily just send the link out to you guys, to Croatia, uh, to try it. And at the end, as I said, to, uh, the, uh, this uh, output gets read by uh, our uh, PBI and then it, uh, it uh, draws the result and so the customer can interact with it and uh, see uh, wh what is good value for it. So uh, this is, uh, uh, with this we conclude our presentation. Uh, so if uh, already now are there any questions, please feel free to ask it. Uh, we'll gladly uh, answer it. Uh, and please don't be shy. Uh, are there any? Is uh, any? Are there people still with us? <laughs> okay. How can you see how many people are there? It's okay. I guess there's no questions at the moment, right? Okay. I think there is 12 participants at the moment. <laughs> ah, okay. So we have at <laughs> least uh, one, uh, <laughs> one watching and 12 on, online. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nicolina, for watching. <laughs> Okay. You're welcome. Great job, guys. <laughs> Continue. Oh, thanks. Helps, <laughs> helps a bunch to relieve the tension, you know. <laughs> uh, okay. Then we will uh, then we will continue to our uh, work uh, workshop, and uh, we will see how much time then this will take, and then we will uh, go to vacation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, firstly, I will present these uh, Asian functions. So we we still have here. I have uh, okay. Uh, okay. So actually what I prepared is, so uh, let's say you have, uh, you have the code, you, you created some code uh, and it works on your computer. Uh, I hope this is familiar, I mean familiar to you. Uh, this is actually our black box that takes care of some, uh, there you, you can see our models forecasting and scheduling. Uh, and this is the code, actually it produces forecasts and then takes care for all the data pipeline, uh, which we can see on the, uh, which we use. So actually what today I wanted to show you is how to put uh, code like this uh, on Asia. So what will I use? I hope that now is, uh, Visual Studio Code implemented really cool, uh, I mean, guys at Visual Studio Code implement really cool feature to work with, um, work with Azure, uh, Azure Cloud. So you don't have actually to use command line interface uh, because uh, Azure, uh, Visual Studio Code actually uh, creates everything for you. So we will open the folder which is this Azure Mela platform. And uh, this is, uh, just let me see a second. Uh -huh. Occasion. So this is our folder. And uh, we will say, okay, we have some source, some, uh, some code, and this is actually Azure functions, uh,
Okay. Uh, this is actually Azure Functions extension for Visual Studio Code. You can download it. I don't know if you if you say to extensions, uh, Azure Functions, any downloads uh, uh, like this, and then you connect to your uh, Microsoft uh, account. I will show you now uh, my Microsoft account, so Portal Azure and uh, uh, everything. Uh, Connect. I'm already connected here with my Adapta account, uh, and uh, okay, I have 123 euros <laughs> on the. I don't know if this is a lot to say. <laughs> Start of a period, just like yeah. getting a paycheck, you're rich. It dwindles by the end of the month. And uh, actually, I am connected here with my uh, already. When you will install your uh, account, it uh, it will uh, create a new account, and then you just say create new project. And uh, I want to create here. So this is my project. Uh, yes, I will use Python, uh, which interpreter. Let's say. Okay, let's see this. We'll see it together uh, uh, later. And here already it asks you if you want to create any trigger. Uh, I won't do skip for now because I already want to do the HTTP trigger because this is the most um, easy way to test if everything works. And we will get HTTP trigger. Do any ha one have any idea what would we, sh we should call it? Mm -hmm. Let's say a trigger uh, workshop. Uh, just for the record, if I go too fast or uh, anyone has a question, please just feel free to interrupt me and then I will uh, stop and answer and try to answer first. So, uh, authorization level, we say this is function because we don't want anonymous to enter. Uh, that means that if you do function, it generates some code you have to, to take uh, to request this. If you do anonymous, uh, I haven't tried this yet, but probably uh, everyone, every, anyone could get request and admin. Uh, Okay, then it asked me if you want to uh, ignore, uh, override git ignore. No, I don't want to override git ignore. Uh, they have requirements. I have already requirements, which also uh, we will see later. And I don't want to override this because um, these requirements uploaded already has all the environment we need for uh, our Azure function. So. Uh, now it, uh, it creates, so you saw it, uh, in five clicks, we already have a new app. Uh, actually, I tried to create this uh, new app with, uh, with uh, commands, so it has really nice command, Fung, Fung host, uh, create new project, blah, 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 some five commands that actually uh, went on uh, behind the scene with just clicking uh, this uh, stuff. Okay. But actually I uh, wanted you to see that uh, uh, I think it will create me now virtual environment. In fact, I wanted to create it myself. Uh, but let's just see what uh, what what he will do. Uh -huh. It will create environment. I hope it will install all, also all the requirements. So uh, if we take a look at our requirements, so uh, actually here are all requirements for Azure Functions, and then there are some my requirements which we need uh, for our. Uh, uh, for our project, we used in our project models from Scikit-Learn and HGBoost. Uh, also NumPy, Pandas, and this is something to read, etc. And everything else is more or less for uh, uh, working with uh, working with Azure. 
Okay, so this is still creating environment. Um, and then we will uh, also try to wait a little bit. Uh, For then we will also try wait a little bit for um putting on the planet. Now we have to wait <laughs> because uh, actually uh HTTP trigger must be uh created. Uh and it takes really long time to create this new environment. I can I cannot stop. Okay, then I will show you how to create environment on ourselves. So we are here on the. Uh, uh, we take a look. So human workshop. Uh, we go to the application, and actually. Uh, virtual environment is created now uh, from some python i have installed on but you can also create a virtual environment with your uh, anaconda distribution if you have any so actually um, what i did here of this uh, python 36 this is just uh, uh, this is just a, a distribution of uh, python 36 which is uh, uh which is 3.6 and it works for from my uh from my experience better than 3.7 uh and then we can actually i will show you now uh which uh which uh, uh which uh code i used just to create so it was like this 3.6 uh 3.6 and created a virtual environment of anaconda but then you have to also create a virtual environment for this uh for this project because uh, actually when you deploy the project to the uh to the cloud it takes your virtual virtual environment and uh, it installs all the libraries uh or you can do it also without it so it installs only uh requirements uh, so what 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 is uh, the code is that uh, a new Python has this um, vnf which is some uh, technology of making virtual environment and we will create the end va since the Visual Studio Code I think already created vn uh, for the for the project. Uh, and this is how the virtual environment gets created, but what is actually called on the hood, what also Visual Studio Code uh, 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 fired it. But as you can see, this is much, much faster than Visual Studio Code needed to create all these virtual environments. But nevertheless, okay, so here we are. Uh, now uh, we can see that actually already. Uh, Visual Studio Code uh, created HTTP trigger for us with all the functions uh, and uh, actually it is already uh, uh, it's already working. Uh, so firstly, just not to wait uh, later on, we will now firstly deploy and create new uh, new workspace on the Azure and then uh, after that we will see how this code works when we will have time. Uh, that uh, Visual Studio Code uh, deploys. So this is our local project. So we know that our HTTP trigger is on our local project. We are now in functions extension and this is our uh, HTTP trigger and here it says something about the trigger. So here we can see that this is the HTTP trigger and actually we wait for get or post and we will uh, and we will also return this uh, http trigger with uh, with, with uh, some message these are my uh, uh, old uh, distributions but 
today we want to now deploy our HTTP trigger, which we will later see how it's working. Just to see, uh, I'll do like this, uh, so that it won't uh, bother me. Okay, we have we want to deploy it. We say deploy to the function app, and then we have here uh, we, which function app we want to deploy to. And we can create a new function app in Azure. Uh, did anyone already come up with some ideas how we want to call our uh, function app? Anyone? Or uh, are you already uh, on the <laughs> on the vacation? I guess it's gonna be workshop. <laughs> We, we don't have much imagination. Yeah. Workshop. Okay. This is attempt number two. I hope that third will be a charm. Yeah. Fry yay. <laughs> Fry yay. There wow. we go. <laughs> nice. Fry. Fry. No, it's e. I, not Y. What? For E, R, Y. So. I think this is better. Hey, how do you want to spell it, Nicolina? We're very particular here. <laughs> it doesn't matter, but I think it's like uh, F R I and then Y A Y. Okay, ah, yeah. Friday. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, nice, nice. Okay, we will say Friday. Uh, okay, cannot use. Okay, you can use minus. Okay, Friday. Well, uh, function. Yeah, it doesn't actually use the underscore. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, you can use only this minus. Uh, yeah, this is pretty common across Asia, actually. I noticed. Yeah, I was pretty surprised even. No, but uh, it's actually uh, it's actually very uh, logical because this gets uh, this uh, in the... go, goes into your URL. Yeah, in the request. So yeah. in the URL, you can have all this yeah. software. Very specific. Software and upper case. It's all. Oh, yeah. Cryo okay. function. Thank you very much, Nicolina. Uh, of course, we will use uh, Python 3.6. Uh, it's good here to use the servers near to you. So we will use West Europe. And that's it. Uh, now function is deploying. And since it takes a little while, uh, firstly, to deploy, uh, we will now go and, and, and see what, what, what we deployed. <laughs> Funny, funny way how to do a project, but okay. <laughs> uh, so actually, what I also wanted to tell is to uh, this is now a philosophical question uh, because uh, Visual Studio Code is really good for the uh, for using uh, for using uh, Azure Functions extension and connecting to extension and so on. But what it bothers me that it doesn't handle uh, Python code very good. So we went to PyCharms, yay. <laughs> uh, luckily we have, uh, we, uh, we have license, but, uh, but still you can uh, also uh, get uh, a free version, a community version of PyCharm and it also, also works like a charm. Also, some some uh, uh, so, some are uh, some are not uh, uh, some are arguing me about the, some could argue about this statement, but still, I I like PyCharm very much for uh, developing Python code and everything else. So, uh, what is actually uh, created? Uh -huh, okay, now we have to add configuration uh, for this uh, Python. So. We will go to settings. Uh, interpreter, and we will go show all. Actually, we have to find it now. Virtual environment, realistic environment, and Let's just use. Yeah. 
Yeah, here. Okay. Now here we, we see here the two processor, right? So maybe this uh, uh, red line will uh, go. Uh, so what actually uh, create uh, is created here is uh, so this is how. Um, Azure Functions works. So uh, it has a, a very good logger. We will see also in the uh, later on. And actually, you you firstly uh, actually all is written here in function dot JSON. So here you will see that type is HTTP trigger. Today we will see also a block trigger. So this is our binding. Uh, you can get get and post. And that, uh, and uh, you have to also specify what will be your out type. And actually, uh, this is also important name. This is how you will reference your variable by your name. Uh, okay, yay! Now you can see that this is uh, almost done because uh, this is the downside of the PyCharm. Uh, it has a lot of time. It uses a lot of time for indexing, but then it looks, uh, it works okay. So uh, what will we now do is to go to our terminal and we are already in our virtual environment. So uh, to try out this code, uh, we will uh, just uh, type, uh, so how to, st uh, how to start these Azure functions locally is to type funds, which is, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is how we fire the function code. Uh, on. Okay. So we now fired the Azure Functions code. Which is also fired in the uh, in the back of the head when we deploy it, uh, and now uh, the functions already get gets to us this uh, trigger workshop uh, trigger workshop uh, link, and we do it on the local host. It opens on the port seven zero seven one. Of course, it's uh, uh, possible to uh, uh, change this, and actually because this is uh, what it says. Uh, is that it uh, triggered uh, successfully, but we have to do, we have to put our get request. So get request is name is uh, Friday. Yeah. Friday. Yeah. Friday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Friday. There we go. Is cool name. <laughs> Friday is cool name, uh, and this is, uh, and that's it. Our uh, actually our uh, Python code got fired, and uh, we can do anything we want in this um, in this uh, in this environment. Uh, and we we can see here that it uh, with logging we printed Python HTTP trigger function process a request, and when it started blah blah blah. Oh, here. It logged our print statement. So with this, we can uh, print where, wherever we want. And uh, when you develop something, I use this quite a lot. Okay, then delete it just to see how my uh, variables are. Uh, uh, today we won't uh, we won't go into debugging uh, code, but we will uh, be helping ourselves with uh, with logging. So now we can check if this is already deployed. Oh, completed, deployed, and now we want to see if this uh, function al also works on the internet. So now we will go back to the uh, to the portal, and uh, we will see. Uh, we will refresh our thing, and we will see our resource group if it uh, created. Yes, we have our resource group try another function. And what actually it creates uh, behind is this function. 
so this is uh, one block uh, one block of what is created it also creates you a storage account it also creates you something for debugging uh, for uh, having application inside this is good for debugging because actually you can stream on li uh, live uh, what is happening with your function uh, with your uh, uh, with your calls, if anyone is using your function and so on, and of course this service plan, which get, uh, gets uh, where you get, uh, you have to pay. So actually, here we have a really nice interface. Uh, what is the most important here is this HTTP trigger. So this is our functions, whichever functions is here listed, uh, you can get it. Uh, and now we have to use uh, see what is our function URL. So this is function URL, and this is what I told you about because we used uh, uh, function. Let, let's say uh, uh, we we have to put here code after our request. Without this, you won't you will get uh, you will get uh, you will actually get an error. We will try this later. Uh, because you you saw that on the uh, you saw here that we we didn't uh, we didn't have to uh, we didn't have to put here any code because we were developing locally and now actually I can uh, try this URL and. Of course, it uh, it didn't work because we didn't uh, put our name. We put our name. name yeah. Uh, okay. Can you put? Uh, I think that uh, Chrome puts your uh, automatically uh, spaces in your account now. Hello. Yes. Any <laughs> and this is anybody with us, it works. So now actually this code is uh uh this code is reachable from anywhere. So uh I think that uh whoever uh put a website online or try to code it knows the pain about certificates about uh, dependencies about uh, windows is or linux engines whatever and uh, with this i think it's very cool that you can uh, actually uh, put this code and get requests really really fastly and uh, and with uh, actually not uh, a few lines of code but few clicks uh, and it all works and then you can actually put your effort which you developed in Python which we are mostly comfortable in uh, with our data with our um, uh, with our uh, uh, knowledge and then just put our results to um, to, to the world because it's very easy to to uh, change this code to uh, to have a post request so you can actually say uh, okay I will now do a post listener just uh, so you could upload me some uh, lines of uh, data and I will do with your data uh, linear regression then of course uh, you name it. Uh, so I am still owe you uh, a little bit explanation of this code. Uh, so we saw in function.json uh, that we uh, actually uh, we, we 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 say what we we will uh, put into the function and what will go out from the function. So here is the uh, here is the declaration where we where we also say this. So we say that our uh, variable named uh, RIQ so request uh, will be a function uh, type of function request and you also return type of function request. So here is something we check if this is uh, really a parameter if it's okay so if it's not okay we say okay it's still okay but please uh, return your name uh, and if you, you you have name then it will say uh, okay this is my name and now uh, we will go to the interesting part 
So now we want to include our uh, our uh, fun function to the to the, our code. So we would want to import. And this is where we start to be um, uh, nervous because uh, ah, uh, because uh, it uh, it doesn't uh, know that we are in the application. So we will go here, and I will just uh, develop from here. So we will import from our app. Uh, actually, we go to source. And then we go to uh, mal, uh, distribution center. Uh, and uh, from here, I have a function called main, uh, which will then be triggered. Uh, so we will be able to, uh, we will be able to, uh, uh, to see, um, to start, uh, to start our function. So actually, uh, now we have um, one, and now we will fire our uh, our function, and we see. So we need some data file, some trigger, and uh, actually, firstly, we need to upload our data. So to upload our data, I want to show you uh, another uh, great tool. It's called um, it's called uh, Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer, and it actually uh, maps all the storage you have uh, to your um, to your account. Now we will refresh if this is already now, uh, and we see that we have this our container this uh, blob storage. So uh, we will actually uh, we will actually uh, read from blob containers. And what is here, we can see that uh, function already created some Azure web jobs. Uh, so these these are actually containers that wait uh, that actually takes care of all the data uh, function creates needs. So it uh, so uh, it can uh, it can work and do all the bindings uh, as HTTP triggers. And this is actually this is actually their uh, their um, uh, their helper blobs. So for first we will create some blob input, and I already had some input here, and I will just copy it. So input. So you can also copy your blobs from one to another, uh, so that. Uh, Copy block container. I don't know now if I have to pass it in input. Yeah, it did, did work because I I shouldn't uh, I shouldn't uh, create this uh, block storage. Let's say if now we'll pass it. Oh, it failed. Okay. <laughs> we will try one more time. Okay, now it works. If we refresh, our data is here. So actually, we will uh, we will uh, we will read a little bit of this data. And then we will uh, hopefully uh, get our uh, our thing running. So uh, what is here? Uh, we, we we check. Uh, actually, we already coded it, and uh, actually um, we want to. Okay, I will uh, delete this output Nino. So this is for um, our colleague Nino, and we will just use it output. So actually. Under the hood, this is like a black box, and uh, I will just put this uh, data file, how it's named in our uh, in our input, and uh, uh, this will be all. And uh, now let me just uh, call it. 
So, uh, how do you say that file is? Uh, and you can then uh, actually, what, what would be better to do uh, is uh, just to see that we can actually call it also with this uh, parameter's name. So, okay, uh, we, we would need uh, some uh, if uh, else clauses just to make sure that uh, these our um, parameters would be string and would be with the file name we have. But let's say uh, we will use this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this trigger responsibly, and we will always uh, always uh, look uh, always put the right name in it. So we will just say data file is name, which we will here uh, here uh, put and. It already restarted. I think yes. So now we will uh, we will go and see uh, here and not here, but on localhost because this runs now on localhost. And we will say uh, data small. So we won't uh, take so much time. X X L S X. Uh, let me see. That is X L S X. When you're a little bit nervous, you, you, you mix up the letters. Okay, let's see what happens. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so error. Uh, what is our error? What our error is that we still haven't told the um, we still haven't told our uh, our program where to look at it. So where, where is our blob storage? He knows that uh, blob storage is on the that web jobs which he need is there. But uh, we have actually uh, define uh, my connection string just to uh, to say hey our blob storage is there in there. And let's do this now. So we will go under uh, local local settings and we will create here a variable called my connection stream and this variable will be uh, so how, how how to how to connect now to our connection stream is here so actually this is our uh, our uh, storage account and this is our blob container, so we have to connect to our storage account. You can find this information on the CLL, you can find this information on the portal, but uh, you can also find this information in this program, so Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer, and it, uh, it is called primary connection string. And I will, now this is some very long string, and I'll pass it to, to this very long string. Uh, and this is actually our uh, uh, our endpoint. So this is our string where we will uh, uh, wh where uh, everything will get connected. So how how now? Why would I save it here and not elsewhere? Is because when you deploy everything that is saved here is uh, encoded, encrypted, and it, it actually isn't seen on the on the web. And now uh, I will uh, I will just take this uh, my connection string, and uh, I think that uh, I have it uh, in this uh, data functions. I will uh, find uh, right away Here in data functions, and I will just uh, I will just uh, change it. Uh, to my storage, uh, my storage connection string because I had it uh, put it uh, on something else, but uh, now it should. So uh, now it should uh, point to the other side. So how you actually uh, are connected to this storage string and how do you call it is uh, actually everything what is here goes to uh, environmental variables. So you have to uh, call it all, always with environmental variables. 
uh, and this is how you how you how you call then your connection stream. And now let's hope it works. So if we do it again, okay, that means that it's still waiting, uh, and we can see here that uh, everything will uh, that some uh, logging will start uh, start uh, working. Uh, did I put it there to output? Okay, let, let, let's just uh, let's just uh, restart this function and see if it if it will uh, go as you plan. Let the table three will function to bring a data smart. Ah, that's that. I'm going to tap pick Ah, it works. Okay. So uh, you go to the restart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it ain't working, just restart it. Yeah. It will work. Yeah, I think my computer isn't working. Powered by Microsoft. Restart, yes. <laughs> this is Microsoft Pro. Just restart it, and it will also always work. So, uh, <laughs> what is actually happening here is now that our code, which we created, so everything from data preparation, data. Um, uh okay okay then uh, oh, did i put aha uh -huh, okay uh what i also uh forgot to do uh is uh to uh create output container so of course uh i i could do this uh, in the code if a container doesn't exist uh created but i didn't do it so now we will just uh, create here in our primal function a uh, um, new uh, new block container, which will be output. And to this output, Nino will uh, hopefully connect if everything goes well. So now we have <laughs> connect, uh, container output. Uh, we say this is our output container because we already went uh, went and give him uh, uh, this. Uh, uh we we gave him a connection string it will work so now let's see if it works so firstly we start a server uh and then we just call it with our data small we could do it with data uh in this data small we have i think 11 items so 11 i uh, what uh, what we have behind is uh 11 items Every item has a daily um, daily sale, and we have a history for somewhat two years, I think. But as I said, Nino will show us, and in the BI, Power BI application, it will be very good uh, seen and shown. Okay, I think uh, that I could also show you a block trigger, but uh, firstly, uh, I will. Um, I will uh, give uh, my words to the NAT and to the to the Nino, and then if we will still have some time, uh, I will uh, show you how to create a block trigger. Just to uh, just to uh, simply put it, we will go to Visual Studio Code and uh, create a block trigger. And block trigger actually is uh, very 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 same thing as um, very same thing as. Uh, uh, as a HTTP trigger, just it not it doesn't get triggered by uh, putting a web uh, website uh, uh, URL in your Chrome or uh, or uh, uh, HTTP uh, protocol, but actually it implements that when you uh, put when you upload some file like we did there on the blob storage, it says oh somebody uploaded a file on the blob storage let's take it from the blob storage and let's put it 
into Python to do whatever uh, we we would want to do. Uh, and this uh, this will do maybe later. Now we can see that we all uh, here already um, it's working uh, our uh, scheduler which produces the data, and we have somewhat data uh, here. And actually, uh, this data uh, later will be read by Power BI and shown in visualization. Uh, okay, uh, again, uh, quick uh, reminder, anyone has any questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, if not, uh, I will now leave my uh, screen and uh, Nats will take care of screen. Nats, will you also, uh, yeah, also will here, yeah. uh, turn on your camera? Yeah, of course. Um, for those who are wondering, I'm sitting adjacent to Martin. I hope you can hear me well, right? We're all on the same mic. Let me move it a bit. There we go. Okay, give me a second. Uh, start video. There we go. Okay, I'm eating the camera basically. <laughs> Much better. Um, what we also want is the share screen. Let me find it. There we go. Oh, I have to click share. Ah, oh, there we go. Let me hide the Zoom chat. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so Martin showed you how uh, how you can go about. Um, setting up an endpoint for uh, for anybody to connect to, you know, to send some data to, to basically do whatever, use an internal API if you want. Um, I will be going in a different, different direction. Um, I will basically be talking about how you can do some prototyping, how you can use Azure to develop models, to actually have a, the whole process from beginning from data pre-processing to analysis all the way to the deployment and to the model. Um, we will do this through um, training um, uh, through training a, a model uh, using AutoML that we you know, talked about earlier. Um, and before we start, we have to take a look, we have to take a look at the, we have to, uh, the, this screen sharing thing is, ah, oh, there we go. We have to take a look at the Azure platform uh, and the first thing that we need to set up uh, is a work uh, is a machine learning workspace. I already prepared it because it takes like a minute or two to, to set up, so I didn't want to waste time doing this. Uh, it's a fairly simple process. You just choose a plan, you choose a subscription, uh, and it sets everything up. It sets up a, a base storage, um, and this, this is how it looks. This is just you know the thing. Um, another thing that you have to prepare before you start working. Uh, of course, it's just a one-time thing. You pre you prepare it, and then you can use you reuse it all the time if you want, right? Uh, is a, a compute instance. This basically is like a virtual environment um, which you can use to run your code on. Uh, it also very conveniently uh, lets you run uh, Jupyter Lab, Jupyter, or R Studio. Uh, SSH here is disabled, but you can set it up um, when you are setting up the whole uh, workspace, basically. As I mentioned earlier, we are using the default edition, not the enterprise edition. Uh, and this is it. Another important thing that we will be looking at is experiments. Uh, this is a way for you, personally, uh, to break down your, um, your different um, runs. You can look at the, um, the models you are training, different scoring metrics that you prepared or that were automatically prepared for you if you are using like AutoML, for instance. Um, and it's basically just there to you know, help you things keep in check, like keep track of things. Um, so this is the this is the compute that we will be using, um, uh, and this is how it looks like. So essentially, it opens up uh, a Jupyter Lab for you in the in the browser that you're using already. Um, I prepared a, a project already. Uh, this is just some a data folder that holds some of the data we will be using. I mean, we will just be using one of these, but, you know, whatever. This could, this could also all be done locally. What we will be doing here can be done locally and you can connect to the uh, Azure from there if you want. Uh, we're just using this to also showcase the GitLab that comes uh, built in because I think it's a pretty cool feature, right? You don't even have to go Jupyter Notebook to run it, basically. Um, 
we will be writing code as we go along. I will be explaining what is happening, what we are doing. It should be, we can skip some steps. We can exchange something for something else and I will be talking about it. So the first thing we want to do when we start, uh, we, we, would, we want to be working with Azure is, you know, connecting to the workspace that we have been looking at previously. So, you know, this, this workspace, the whole thing, this. Um, the, the code for this is pretty simple. I have a, a few commands here and like, you know, how, what to go through, what to mention. Um, so the first is just setting up a workspace. It's pretty simple. Go through workspace, uh, and we will we will set it up from a config file, which is this file here. It's a JSON. Uh, it has a subscription ID, um, a name of the resource group, uh, which holds all your resources, and the workspace name, which is you know, the overarching thing in which the resource is also located in. Um, um once we will be connecting to it so from config we have to go one back because we are right now open open we have opened a notebook inside the notebook folder so we have to go um this is the one we're doing working with so we go one up and we go straight to the uh, oh my god <laughs> i go straight to config.json um and yeah this is basically it we are connecting to the workspace um, now, the first thing you might, of course, be asking is, well, I can do this as well, right? Um, because we have cookies enabled in this browser, we are already connected as, you know, me. But if it were me connecting from a different computer, there would simply be a pop-up um, informing that I have to log into my um, Azure account, and it would automatically tell you, like, okay, go ahead, this is, a, this is a, okay to work for you, you can connect to this workspace and make changes, so it will basically just, you know, stop you, like, chill back a bit, you're too short for this ride, right? Uh, <laughs> or maybe just, you know, put the password in wrong, which is not usually happen. Um, so yeah, yeah, you connect to, <laughs> yeah. So you, you, you connected to the workspace, which is, which is step one. Um, as Martin, Martin mentioned earlier, you are also connect, you also have a, you also, you also have a um, storage account created for you automatically when you create, when you create a workspace. Uh, we can take a look at it using Storage Explorer. Uh, this, this, this is the Mino demo storage account that was created, and it has some tabular data prepared, some files, some queues, and some blobs. We will be saving this in blobs, which is you know, super convenient because you can put basically anything in there, from video to image to Excel to cover the files, anything. Um, so yeah, we want to connect to the data store because we will be uploading data up there just for you so that you see how it works. It's a very simple command, just you get there super easily um, for uploading and downloading as well, of course. But first we need to, we need to go through workspace. Um, again, default data store. So let's see what happens, okay. Okay, we are connected to the default data store. Uh, Another thing that we will be using um, is, a, uh, is a remote compute. Uh, in this case, it's the same compute that we are working on at the moment, you know, for convenience sake. Uh, but you could be really using any kind of um, remote compute uh, prepared on Azure. You can run it basically anywhere. It can be a virtual environment, virtual machine learning environment, um, whatever. Um, so yeah, um, we're going to be doing this by looking at the compute targets. So this will just give me, oh, voila. Dictionary object not call, what am I doing wrong here? I'm gonna just assign it right away. Okay, and now we're gonna just iterate through this. Um, compute targets, it will just be the one compute target that we've seen earlier, right? It's gonna be, let's go there. Um, it's gonna be this one that we are using already, which might might seem a bit redundant, you know, to deploy code to a environment we're already working on. Um, but it's just so that you can imagine if I were doing this locally or if I wanted to do my work here and then deploy um, my code on a, um, and run it on a way more powerful environment, uh, virtual environment. I could easily do that for a, for a, for a powerful compute instance. So yeah, from set to in set class, I'm gonna print CT, boom. Right, and it's just the one, so this is the one we will be 
uh, connecting to, right? Let's say AML equal. Uh, oh, yeah, AML compute. It's just a class allows you to connect to the demo compute DSC. Boom. Okay. Okay, so this is it. This is a reference to the compute that we will be using. We will be passing this onto the uh, auto ML config, which is required for us to just uh, send our code and have it run in the auto ML uh, section of the Azure suite, basically. So actually, this is the same computer that same virtual machine that takes care of Jupyter and your code. Yeah, this is what I was saying before. It's a bit redundant yeah. in a way, right? To just have a code jello. I could just do everything here, right? We just go do uh -huh. this here, go, go, go. But I'm gonna, you know, yeah, pretend, defense, pretend defense, I'm yeah. doing this locally, or I'm gonna pretend this is a way more powerful machine. You're doing this on the yeah, and, and we can. Hard. Yeah, yeah, it's a very computationally intensive, you know, yeah. thing we're doing here. So, um, so yeah, um, we're also gonna give this this thing experiment name. Um, this is just a, uh, let something fry, yay, demo, DSC live, too much. Oh yeah, we're just gonna go with the fry demo. Uh, this is just <laughs> the name of our experiment, basically. Um, the experiment will be logged in here, uh, and we'll, as we will see it later, uh, it will be um, showing up here, and we will be able to keep track of the models that are being built, which are the best, which are the worst, and we will be able to deploy them from here as well. Um, so yeah, we will be creating an experiment which is experimental. Expelliarmus. Workspace. Uh. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay, try a demo. So we have prepared an experiment. We could also be connecting here to an experiment that already exists. But for, you know, for the purposes of the demonstration, we'll be creating our own. Um, we'll be loading the data from here. Um, demo data. We'll take this one. It says hidden because I hit some of the names of the items that, we'll, that we'll, we will be looking at. Is now nah, you give me a second. But it's as well. So we're just reading in the data from the data folder. Demo data. CSV. I uh, will also be parsing dates. I think it's like the syntax it should be like this, right? Uh, and index call should also be the same one. Yeah, okay. So this is the data we are looking at. It's super simple. It's just the uh, name of the item, the amount of sales that were made, and a date on which the sales were made. Um, let's just call it. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Zero originality. It is what it is, guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, give me a second. Let me scroll a bit. Is there a scroll button here? My. No. Um, so, yeah. Let's look at the data. Okay. So, this is it. Um, we will be making a super simple split, just in train test. Um, I mean, we'll just be using train basically. So train set. I want train set to be all the data up to let's say uh, 2020. I'm just doing this because I already know that. Give me a second. Sort index. Goes through. Um, Okay, because I know that it ends, I think, in April of 2020, and it's the same for all items. They all have um, sales data um, going up to the 23rd of April here. So for our train, we will be using everything up to 2020, which is like two years of data for most of the items you are using here, right? These are you are using now all like all the the train. You mean the whole one? Yes, because it's inclusive. Uh, if you take uh, you take the 2020, I think I, don't know. I think this is okay. No, no. Let's take, take a look. Train set is now to detail. Ah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Because it's inclusive and it takes all the 2020. You're right. You're right. 
you are not mistaken here. <laughs> the pressure got to me. <laughs> uh, okay, so we have our training set, our test set. Um, I think the test set won't even come in handy because the whole auto ML function takes at least half an hour to complete. Um, so we'll just be looking at um, what we can do after it's done, not actually doing it. Uh, so yeah, we have the train set. Um, so that, of course, we will be uploading it to a, to a storage so that you can imagine you know, how the whole thing works, uploading data to a storage, downloading data to a storage. It's actually pretty simple. Um, we just want to go data store dot upload. All right. First, we have to save our data. We're going to put it into data upload. Basically, this is a folder that I will be uploading to the data storage, the whole thing, right? Uh, we, we could be also including our custom code here. So if I wanted to, you know, run my own code, not uh, just the auto ML part of the suite. So if I had the whole hyper opt with grading, boosting, some pre-processing, a whole bunch of features being created, you know, something very custom. I could just save it to a file, save the, uh, and then upload the file to the storage, and I would simply, um, simply tell the the Azure, uh, simply tell Azure to you know execute that file, and that file will then take care of everything else, basically. Um, but in this case, that won't be necessary. We'll just be saving the train set. So so uh, let's say train set, CSV, the index yes. Back. Data upload. Okay, so this should be in here now. Yeah, oh, obviously I have the test set from before when I was playing around with the with the commands. Okay, um, and we will be uploading it uh, to a certain folder in the data storage, which we can, I guess, also create. Let's say logic folder will be called Fraya. Oh, Fraya. <laughs> <laughs> Fry a <laughs> demo. <laughs> Let's say workshop. workshop demo. Live. Okay, so this is this will be this is the name of the um, folder in the uh, blob storage that we have been looking at before, uh, which will be basically created automatically as we are uploading the data. Um, we just go df that upload. Mm. So it's a dir. I think it's the one. Yes. Data upload, and this will automatically take all the files inside the data upload folder and upload them to the storage. Um, target file. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Project folder uh, overwrite. It's true. Yeah, show progress just for the fanciness of it. So this works, boom. Okay, that was it. That's pretty fast. The files are fairly small. Uh, and we can also take a look at this data now. Let's look at the storage explorer. Ah, there we go. It was there already. Storage explorer. Uh, take a look at our mean demo storage. It was automatically created. The blob store. And this is it. Workshop demo live. We have the two files that have been uh, uploaded, right? And this is, these are the two files that we will not be downloading. It's the same command, basically, right? We have to set up the path to it. Um, I'm just doing this so that you can, you know, see how it basically, how simple it is to play with data, to send it somewhere, to get it back, to you know, look at it. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll be sending the path. What we call it? Workshop demo live. And you want the train set, right? Train set, let's see, see. Hey, there we go. And it's a data reference basically to that, uh, to that specific file in the store. Mm. Uh, yeah, this is it. Um, before we give any kind of data uh, to the Azure ML script or the config file, basically, uh, we have to turn it into one of, I think, three or four specific types that um, Azure uh, uh, auto ML accepts. One of, the, one of those is um, tabular, dataset.tabular. Um, so we have to like transform it a bit. So 
from data set and from data set uh, from the limited. And it's going to be the path that you already put in earlier. Doesn't have from the limited. I'm sure I messed up the caps or something. File save. Downloading them, which took a bit longer than uploading two files, but okay. Um, so there we have it train data set to pandas data frame. I just, let's just look at the head of the data we're working it. Oh, why is this not data defined? Am I doing something wrong? Oh, of course I am. There we go. Okay, so again, this is the, the thing we are working with, date, we call it the sales, we went over this, so not really important. We successfully downloaded it, we prepared it into the tabular data that the auto ML function will accept. Um, now we will be now we will be uh, um, basically preparing preparing the config file for the auto ML. Uh, I wanna I wanna note here as we are going through all the options, uh, you keep you have to keep in mind that if you are working with a file, it is called an estimator config. It's just a bit different class that you're using, um, but many of the many of the parameters are the same, and the whole process up to this point is essentially the same, right? You can get the data from wherever you want. You can upload the file that you want um, your custom code to run um, beforehand. Uh, you can plug it in here. You can plug the data in later on the server. And all of these things are super simple one-liners, um, which really allow you to go through the whole process super fast, right? Um, so um, we will be just config preparing. Is this cool? Yeah, okay, okay. It's okay. Um, now, the task we'll be doing forecasting. You could also be doing regression or classification. But as I mentioned, the forecasting really in the back end um, uh, uh, looks at the prob problem in a, in a reg regressional way um, because we're not using the enterprise edition. But, you know, it, it's forecasting what we're doing basically for the for the time series, this is the default uh, default way of dealing with you know auto ML and uh, forecasting time series. Um, what other option does it have? Oh, as I, as I said, classification uh -huh. uh, and regression and forecasting. And forecasting is the one that we'll be using, yeah, of course. Um, primary. You have to set up the primary metric. Uh, here we will be using. Uh, Maya probably, yeah, we're gonna use Maya. I think normalize mean absolute error. This is one of the many options you have when it comes to auto ML. In this case, we just chose normalized uh, Maya, but it could really be anything, Pearson coefficient, whatever. Um, there's a timeout, uh, timeout limit that you have to set on the whole process. Frame timeout limit. I think that's the name. Oh, no, I'm wrong. It's about hours. Let's just say one hour. We could say 0.25, which is, I think, the least. Yeah, I think this is the minimum you need to run the auto ML, auto ML task for. Um, we will be going training data, training data, which is the train data set that we have prepared in the data set, the tabular, whatever form before. Um, um, cross validations. Just give me a second. Our cross validations should be four. Like I'm sure there is a typo somewhere in here, so we'll probably be going back to these things. Um, as I'm saying this, a cross validations is not something you usually use in a uh, in a in a time series problem, right? Um, because it just goes against the basic statistical assumption of the you know canonical uh, k-fold uh, cross-validation but um and this is pointed out in many different uh areas in documentation they are using the <laughs> rolling cross-validation uh, which is uh, a special way of uh, going about cross-validation and it doesn't you know uh, go against any of the basic principles 
that should be upheld for the cross validation to uh, remain its uh, or to keep remain its integrity essentially, right? Uh, so cross validation in this regard is completely fine. <laughs> Nothing we should be worrying about. Um, label column name. This is the name of the this one. So this is the target variable, um, which is something which is the, the variable that we want the auto ML to learn to you know optimize how to predict correctly. Um, we have to set the compute target that we prepared before. It's ML compute, I think. Give me a second, let me scroll up a bit. No, we just call it AML. Okay, AML it is. Do you maybe know just uh, the high level of what this cross validation, uh, how it looks like? Yeah. This continuous um, cross validation. I actually think I have an, a picture somewhere near here. Yeah. Um, this is how it works basically. Mm -hmm. it's, it takes the first X samples and it predicts the next one. It's the first X plus one samples predict the next one. This can be also done if you want, you know, to optimize your forecast for like four I steps ahead in this case, or n steps ahead. You can specify that, and it will go like this. So just for you know, for the so the first for one imagination. Is the fault or uh, you you specify it. the first one. Yeah, the first one is the fault, and if you want something special, you have to specify it basically. Mm. Um, and you can specify this this with a parameter as well, which we will not be using today, but, you know, because we don't really care how well the whole thing works at the end of the day just that you know the way we go about making it work is you know the point of this presentation mm. so we selected the compute target we gave it the data we said this is the one thing you wanna you wanna be forecasting um yeah i wanna voting ensemble just just to show off some of the fancy things you can do it can you know make different stacking and ensembles and stuff like that on its own um Velocity. Oh, we're not gonna do this. Um, we want, yeah, this is also useful fun, uh, useful, useful uh, parameter, which is basically uh, the amount of cores you want to be using. Uh, if you just set uh, max cores per iteration minus one, it uses up all the cores. But if you just want to be using like half the cores on a specific machine, you can also do that. You just set the number of cores you want to be using. So that's pretty straightforward as well. Oh, yeah. This again. Mm, we also want, yeah, the time column name. The time column name here is date. And we also have to set up green column names. The green column names um, is going to be item code here. Uh, what this allows is for us to build one model that will be taking into account uh, multiple different series. So for item one, it, it will be, you know, forecasting for item two, and it will build specific features for each and every single one of them, uh, and it will bake them all into one big model, essentially. Uh, and it's a, it's a pretty useful, useful feature. Train data set is not defined, so. That is it. That is it, okay, I see, I see the problem, yeah. <laughs> we want this, right? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, before we go on to actually run the whole thing, um, I want to mention all the things that happen here, like behind the scenes. Uh, one of them, as I already said, is uh, building up uh, features. Uh, the first type of feature that is built is uh, date specific, so you know, different um, modulations on the on the whole um, time aspect of the time series. Um, the second one is grain based. So those are specific to the certain uh, item, for instance, that we are forecasting. Okay. Um, um, one thing that also happens um, it is it detects the um, the frequency automatically. So in our case, it's a day, it could be a month, a year, or a week, a second, if you will. Um, and if there are some irregularities within the time series, which means that there are uh, there is a day one and day three, but the day two is missing. It will automatically fill the, the, the day two in, uh, which basically lets you, you know, cut down on the pre-processing part a bit if you're just prototyping just to see uh, what happens. You know, overnight you leave it running and you can already see what kind of results you're going to make. You can expect, you know, ballpark estimate 
uh, when you will be actually making a full-on um, model with all the features that you will be um, custom building and all the parameter tuning and everything, right? And what is the field method? Is it zero or is it? Oh, uh, it's forward or? field. Yeah. It, oh, it's a median, but it's a forward feeling median. So basically, if you have date one, value one, and date three, value three, it's gonna take the median, which is kind of awkward in this case. There are just two samples, right? And let's say there's a day four or five as well, um, uh, and it will feel it um, forward, basically. So I'm just taking from the first one and going down. Uh, just, just the normal forward field. Um, so this is it. Um, is there something else I want to mention? Um, the uh, categorical values uh, will be automatically uh, well, encoded into numerical, which is also a good feature to have, so you don't have to get down and dirty the first second you get the data set, uh, if you want to go about it that way, of course. Mm, and that's basically it. So we have this uh, we have this config set up. Uh, we can just prepare the remote run, uh, which is just the experiment. And we want to submit this thing out on the config. Uh, show output. Output. If you want this to be false, so remote run. Uh, remote run. I think I want to wait for the. Yeah, wait for completion. Um, and this is basically it. I think if we didn't mess up any of the settings, we should be um, making the virtual environment um, run the auto ML module and run the experiment essentially. Um, you can do some stuff after this. Uh, you can wait for the completion of the algorithm if you are relying on the output of the model. Um, that will be produced here. Of course, here we will have like 15 different models produced because it's auto ML, uh, and you can automatically select the best one uh, on a on a metric of your choosing. So it could be my, it could be map, it could be persons, whatever, uh, and then use that model to to use it on your uh, to predict any kind of um, data later on. And that's basically it. You can look at the details by clicking on the link that conveniently opens up. Uh, this is the workspace that we have prepared earlier. I mean, there won't be much to see yet because it's preparing the whole thing and it's gonna be running for quite a while, but we can take a look at the, um, oh, give me a second. We can take a look, a look at the, one of the runs that we already um, did in the morning. So we can just take a look at you know, what the whole thing does basically. Uh, so it takes different different algorithms with different parameters. Uh, it does different uh, permutations on the features, you know, on the features that it automatically creates. Uh, and this is the normalized mean absolute uh, error that it is showing here. Uh, but we could be looking at any kind of um, uh, metric we want to be looking at, basically. You know, the metrics, so we can see all the errors here. Uh, as I said before, the numbers here are not relevant. It's just about the process, right? Um, uh, we can also look in the case of a stacking model, or is it an ensemble here in this case? Let's look at the models. Yeah, and you, you can actually look at the explanation, which is a very, a very good feature. Um, let's hope it draws it out. Yeah, of how important a specific feature is in a specific case. Uh, and once you, you are built, no, this is not very useful in this specific case because we only have like one feature basically, right? Two, two in this case, like item code as well. But one of these is just to uh, separate the series one from another. But when you have multiple features, this is also one very cool way to look at them and you can um, force it to look at um, relief F or you know any other feature importance, uh, SHAP values that you want to be using, right? Um, so this is it. And once you have a model, uh, you can, just as easily as we did all these things, you can just as easily select it and you can put it to production. You can save it in a blob storage and access it from there. And it, of course it can be accessed after you, you have set up the Azure functions. Um, you can easily connect it to the model you have prepared. Uh, it can easily be, the output of it can easily be connected to the Power BI and it can be visualized. So the whole circle, the whole cycle is very homogeneous and it's very, 
easy basically it's very it's very fun to use i was i have been i have tried to use uh different um um, um cloud based options uh for machine learning right a few years back but all of them seem to be lacking one thing or another not everything was clicking as it should be but at this point in time i can safely say that uh, this is a very well thought out solution with many different points of you know attack and you can really customize any part of the process to suit your specific business um, needs um, and yeah it's very nice mm, so one of the business needs is visualization and that is something that uh, Nino will be going over so I will be passing over the baton to you maybe also. I will uh, just stop it if uh, yeah go ahead. anyone uh, from the public has question for nuts maybe yeah, questions are always welcome, of course. Give me a second. I'm gonna be stopping this share because for some reason I don't seem to be seeing. Okay, not I questions. have one question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think that you, as you said, you also used this uh, on Azure. So my question is, uh, with uh, which uh, with which uh, artillery you attacked it and how much you paid for it uh, in the consumption manner. As I said earlier, mm -hmm. we, we we get 120 euros. But uh, my question is, uh, how expensive this is for the amount of work you can do? For example, and I think that uh, some of our data science colleagues that are listening yeah, are if, if you're also just... always always asking how much this costs i don't know yeah. how much cost uh development wise um aside from the model building the whole thing doesn't take up much resources especially if you don't have huge data sets um even the model building part isn't that expensive uh and you can easily stop it into 150 to 200 euros a month if you're really using it on a daily basis uh, multiple compute instances running um but of course saying any concrete number here is very inconvenient because there are many pricing options on storages on compute on workspaces on you know every single thing um and it's very hard to give a, a, a specific number but if you want uh, an estimate of your own you can easily i think go to um asia website uh, on input. High level, what, what you used on high level uh, cpu uh, ram uh, and how much did you yeah okay let's say you have you have two instances running each has eight gig ram of cpu um, I think I mean, I think around, yeah, six gig on the, the storage. You have a few you, storage isn't expensive, so you can have like one terabyte, but you don't usually need that much. Um, for pretty cheap, you can have six to so ten cores and two of these running throughout the month. And I think you would spend about 150, 150 euros, right? Let's say. And this is quite a lot of um, computing, you know, if you just think about it the whole time. In reality, of course, we aren't using it um, morning to um, um, to noon, uh, to tonight, but um, we are, you know, closing the instances as we go from work if you're not using them uh, you know, to save up some money. Um, and adding to this, when it comes to pricing of the functions, um, they are designed in a way that uh, allow you to um, have a pricing based on the amount of uh, consumption you actually have. So if you have 10 calls a day, that costs a cer certain amount, right? Uh, or you can use uh, web APIs, uh, web, app, uh, web apps, which is very similar to Azure Functions, but it forces you to build your own um, your own uh, API calls, right? Like you have to use a framework like Node.js, Flask, or maybe Django or something. Um, and that is more for, for, for higher traffic counts. It's a bit more convenient, I think pricing wise so yeah um i think that's it from my side uh if you have any questions please ask away um if not we will also be available for questions after this presentation uh, after this workshop is over and yeah this is it from my side thanks a bunch uh, yeah go ahead quick quick question uh thank you for your presentation and um i just um uh, wanted to ask so I understand that this uh, this is actually the the point of this machine learning auto auto machine learning is uh, just to have a pr quick preview. But uh, if you had uh, experience uh, in comparing it to like real machine learning that you did afterwards, uh, how good is it? 
you know, um, you, you got it, like some prediction here and then you did some machine learning yeah, afterwards. I, I was actually positively surprised. Um, for instance, we had, I'm just ballparking it here, but like from memory, uh, on one project, I just tested out AutoML in the beginning because it was super fast and convenient and it got me an error rate of let's say seven to eight percent i think uh, and all everything that was said and done we had the i think mape was uh, we're talking about mape here the error rate was three two to three percent but this is just one specific case but i mean i was still you know pretty positively surprised for the amount of work i put in i got an okay result you know um and this is something you can you know a look at you can look at different models that were used in the parameters and you can you know, go from there right maybe elastic net was super efficient every single time the auto ml tried it so you can maybe go in that direction right um or the ensemble that consisted of uh gradient boosting and um cat uh, cat boost was very good did the same thing basically whatever um was very nice so you use that thing right so it's also it's a it's a very solid tool just to start off thing to start off you know the whole process um, but i would still suggest everyone that if you are going for any kind of you know um business grade machine learning you have to custom build everything I mean, everything i mean the whole thing has mm -hmm. to be custom built right um, from the parameters to the um to the features to the section of the algorithm um everything should be very you know, finely tuned to the case at hand no free lunch theorem right yeah no, no free, free lunch, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's for free. Yeah. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Nats. And yeah. thank you, Nicolina, for yeah. still being with us here. And now I'll take screen sharing from Nats. Share screen. Oh, and start video. You see me? Uh, okay. This is the part on Power BI. We will show. We will be uh, showing. Uh, so here is the app you have seen before on the presentation. This is the app has uh, all the uh, output data for, that Martin did in his uh, during his uh, model training, and we can see here sales uh, from uh, historical sales, forecasted sales, and how the stock is changing and how uh, how uh and recommended orders that we have but we will try to do this by ourselves at least to create this and this and this graph and then we'll return to this app so because we are we are already over our time limit so to do it a little bit quickly so here is the power bi that's completely closed that's just opened so i would just try to emphasize that uh in power bi just be careful with language that's uh the default language of the Power BI because of decimal comma, decimal uh, separators, and uh, the date formats. So we will first connect to uh, Bob Storage. We go to Get Data and we go to More. And we wait a bit. And now it's showing uh, Get Data. You've seen this on presentation. We go to Azure. Uh, we go. We pick Blob Storage and we connect to Azure Blob Storage. And now we get prompted to uh, provide account name and URL. And we used, uh, if I remember right, uh, fry yay ml fun function as the account name. And we press OK and wait a bit. And now we get asked account key. You can find account key on Blob Storage. Martin provided it, me, uh, provided it to me. So I just copied it and pasted it. And now we connect to our uh, blob storage ah fry a edit sorry it's right with a right yay and the same connection and we are now connected to that blob storage martin saved all the data uh, results in this output folder so it choose it and will not just load data will transform it so we'll get transferred to a uh, power query of power bi and here this is power query 
Uh, and we now have to pick the table that we're going to import and we will import the table uh, DF simulated all CSV, this one here, we click binary. And now you can see this is uh, Power Query. It's really good that you can use, use it. Uh, really, it's really user friendly. You don't have to write code, although you can't in advanced editor here. But you see here all the steps that we applied and how the data is changing from the source, navigation, then we import the CSV, we promoted headers, and we ch that then Power BI automatically changed the type. So uh, columns, but we won't use that because we will just pick the columns that we need. Here are many columns in this data. Uh, for this demo, we will need datum key, we will need article chiffre, we will need zaloga dnevnav, sorry, uh, forecast and product origin real, and we will need somewhere later today, and we will remove all other. Uh, I'm sorry, I will remove all other columns. So we just keep uh, those few columns. We'll change the format of datum key using locality to make sure it's in format day, month, year. So we put the date format, we press OK. And we'll change those three uh, columns to whole number, since it's integer, and this one also using locality to to uh, date type. Also to show you a bit how we can transform the data, uh, we will split uh, the log at name into two parts in historical and future, uh, because I already know that it's combined, so we'll use conditional column. And we will use on datum key, we will make it stock history column, which is before or equal to column today. That's why we kept it column today. Uh, I first have to mention that this is a data we took that's uh, the last date of uh, our data is 23rd of April. So it's not live data, it's data we uh, received before. So the last, so we count it as today. Uh, 23rd of April, and we will output the log at Nevna. And we'll make one more column just to make future. So, stock future, where datum key is after or equal to column today, output the log at Nevna, and we'll also change those two to number and we'll ch may change the name of query to table stock sales okay and now we'll add one more query we can just do it we don't have to apply the query uh, before we can just add it from source right here and again more is the same procedure as before to connect to uh, blob storage because we need also the table uh, that, con that contains uh, our recommended orders. So again, we connect to Blob Storage. It's the name Fry A M L fun function. Now we're not getting asked to provide key because we already connected it to before. And this time we get one more query here. This time we will we will pick the four order sol. And again, we, we won't take all the columns, we will just pick article chiffre, date of order, uh, we will take a lead time, order frequency, uh, we will take safety stock, uh, quantity to order, and when they're not, just not to keep all the data, keep only the ones that we actually need. And we'll change the type of date to date. Okay, it's the data, it's date type, and lead time, frequency, and quantity order are integers. So whole number and safety stock is 
decimal number. And this is it because those other fields are text fields. And we'll just go here and close and apply and our query will apply. I forgot just to rename it, but it doesn't matter. We can rename it later. Uh, the name of the table. We'll just keep it output for this demo. So now the queries are getting applied and the data is getting imported into Power BI. And now we have some data in. But we'll first go to relationship view just to see if there's a relationship already made between uh, those two tables. It hasn't been, so we'll just connect uh, tables via article chiffre and it's many to many connection both ways. We press OK. And now those tables are connected. And now we'll do some visualizations here. So here is the visualization pane, and here are the fields that we can import. We won't use filters on this example right now. And first we'll just use some slicer just to filter data per item. So we just put, simply just check article chiffre to have a filter of article chiffre. And we'll just change it a bit. We'll use drop down and we will change the name to English. So item. And we will make sure it only can be one selected item on this filter. And now the really cool part, the cool part are visualization, through visualizations. So we will use a uh, bar chart or in Power BI is called column chart uh, to show historical and future sales. So we put datum key uh, on the x-axis and just uh, select Prodaya, which is the past, data, the past data and forecast as future data. Power BI automatically uh, converts a uh, date uh, format to hierarchy of year, quarter, month, day, but we won't use that. We will just use use it as is. So here you can already see how the data looks like. So these are historical data and these are the few the, our forecasted uh, sales data from the algorithm that Martin did. Uh, so I'll just uh, edit a bit the design of uh, this graph. For example, we'll remove the title of x-axis, we will remove the title of y-axis, uh, we'll change, we'll remove the whole title from it, we'll change colors a bit, maybe historic, uh, this product is historical, maybe uh, change it to some, ah, say greenish, I think it was greenish, and the forecast can be blue one, and we'll change the names so we can know what actually fields represent. So it's sales history. And this one is sales forecast. This is a cool graph of uh, our forecasted sales and historical sales that were input to uh, our model. But we also want to see what will happen with stocks. So we'll create a line chart that will show uh, how the stock is changing uh, in history and how it's changing in future with respect to our forecasted sales and our recommended orders. So we subtracted uh, forecasted sales and added uh, recommended orders when they happened. So we'll plot uh, datum key and the two columns we created via conditional column, stock future and stock history. Again, we will change it to datum key. So we have hierarchy. And it's already, it already it already looks cool, so that's good. And we will again change a bit the design. We'll remove the, the titles of, on x uh, on x axis on y axis. We'll remove the title, and we'll remove the overall title. But here we want to add one more thing. We want to we still since our model is actually optimizing with respect to uh, safety stock. That's why we kept safety stock here in this table. We will plot also safety stock of this item. Now it automatically gets summed, but we don't want to use sum of all values that that are in the field. So we will just use average. We'll change it here to average. And now you see here what our model does in the future. It tries to keep uh, stock always above the safety stock. And we can change the design of this uh, of this data a bit. Future again can be blue, history green, and safety stock since that's error, 
Is the future bright? Can you make the future bright? <laughs> yeah, we can make it white so we can't see anything. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. And we can also get, change the shape of uh, of lines. So maybe customize each series. And we if we choose safety stock, we can make the dashed line a bit tinier. And now you see it. And also we will use a pivot table or matrix in Power BI to plot uh, our recommended orders. So we will choose uh, categories of article, chiffre, uh, date of order, and vendor. And uh, we will uh, show the values of lead time, order, fre order frequency, and quantity to order. And first we will just to uh, change the design a bit. So all the categories are in rows. Vendor is actually the first category. Data of order is the second and so on. And we'll change names to make it a bit prettier. Lead time, lead time. Lead time is actually when the order is made, how long, how many long in days it takes for the order to come to the warehouse. So this is important to uh, count when uh, we are making recommendations. Oh, I made a typo here. So, for uh, for the frequency, and the last one is quantity. And also, I just want to show you, since we mentioned DAX as a really important uh, part of Power BI, how we can create uh, an additional column. So we can create an additional column right here. We can make a new column, and we can write an expression. Right now, the DAX will open. And we can write an expression here. For example, we can uh, take a look how many distinct items are getting ordered on each day. For example, so we make a column distinct items, and the formula would be something like if uh, quantity to order is over zero, then put one. And just press enter, or you can click this check mark here. And we'll add this column also to our Power BI chart. And one more thing, since we don't want to look at uh, sums so of order frequency lead time, you can also change it to a minimum here of each item. Also for this quantity. So this is like uh, how we can simply create a simple dashboard or simple report in Power BI and look at our data. And I would like to shift now to the already created app that we did uh, before this uh, workshop, just not to waste too much time on showing graphs since we already are 22 minutes over the time. Uh, so here is uh, uh, yeah, but workshop is until two. Okay, then that will be exactly in time. <laughs> okay, this is the, uh, the dashboard. What it shows here are the graphs that we created. This is historical sales, but these are aggregated by week. And these are uh, forecasted sales. And again, here, are, uh, here is the historical stock and forecasted stock uh, of an item. Again, here are the uh, orders. But uh, those here are not uh, connected to filters. So this this uh, this table is showing all the orders that will happen on 23rd of April for all items. And here are some KPIs we added. Uh, this uh, for item we are showing KPIs. For example, what's the current stock of the item? What's the inventory turnover days of sales of inventory? Uh, some KPIs about sales. For example, uh, quantity of sales in the past one, two, or four weeks. Also forecasted sales sales in the same period and so on. And the last plot is just showing the, what's happening in the history, how the sales are happening and how our orders are coming to uh, our warehouse. So blue ones when the order comes and the red ones that are going uh, down are the negative. So this is where the sales are happening from our warehouse. Uh, so uh, we already said that uh, we use Power BI to inspect our models and uh, our how our LRR our, algorithms performing. Uh, so let's take a look at, for example, this item. What we can see here uh, is that uh, we are lowering uh, the stock overall. So we're always trying to keep the stock above 
uh, the safety stock, but never overstock like in this period where uh, we overstocked uh, with the items. Also, we can look some other items. Uh, for example, this item. Uh, with this item, just wait a bit. Uh, this is the this this is this is the really good part about Power BI. We can just slice any item we want and we just quickly see the results of this item. Uh, for example, here, uh, Bojidara on Tuesday said that uh, we do this kind of predictions because we want to avoid stockouts, so to keep stock a bit higher than something if something happens and we don't have. Uh, no, if we have no items in stock, we can sell them, so we want to avoid stockouts, but we also want to keep the stock low. So here in the history, the stockout happened, and somebody ordered too much then. So here is the overstock. Somebody ordered really too much of this item. But what our algorithm will do, it will never go uh, beyond safety stock, and we will always keep it above, uh, we will always uh, never keep it too high as here, so not too overstock. Uh, so this is pretty much it. So, you, so uh, we use it uh, to not only just see uh, what our algorithm is doing, but sometimes our algorithm is performing uh, some uh, what somebody in the warehouse could say weird, but we can take a look. Maybe something happened before, and we can just inspect why uh, from this historical uh, data would not would our algorithm perform this way. And this is pretty much it from me. And Martin said that he has something to say. It since we have your five more minutes, mm -hmm. I saved you. I saved you five minutes to say it. Okay, now uh, uh, I'll just stop sharing. And if you have any questions, just ask. We provided our emails and yes. everything, and you can ask now or after Martin. <laughs> no, I think that we will conclude our presentation. Uh, Nat, you can also turn on your yeah, camera. Give me a so second. Give me a second. Uh, <laughs> Gotta fix my. <laughs> now we will be all from our laptops, but in the same room. Uh, yeah, we really are. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, thank you. Sad možemo i malo na hrvatski. Hvala Hrvoje i Nikola, Nikolina, da ste nas slušali do kraja. I hvala i Jelko tu da ste nas povabili i slušali. Tako da, evo, i Žarko se nam je pridružio.